Let's close our eyes for prayer. Our Father, we thank you very much for our Bible study today. Thank you because it's always a joy to come before you and to study your word. For those who are truly born again and they have living faith, saving faith, lively faith, it's a wonderful thing to come together and to fellowship with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and to fellowship with the people of God around the table of this spiritual food. Lord, we are praying tonight that your word will come forth and enrich every life in Jesus' name. We are asking, Lord, that the joy of studying your word and the blessing of those who study your word will come upon every one of us here tonight in Jesus name. We pray Lord that the verse we're going to study and the references we're going to look at. We pray Lord you will just open the pages of the scriptures to us and open our heart to the scriptures so that it will enrich our lives in Jesus name. Thank you Lord because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're looking at Second Peter. We started the study of the second epistle of Peter to the saints, to the children of God, some two, three weeks ago. This is actually our third study. I want to remind you, as we look at Second Peter chapter 1, verse 1, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us. Stop there for a moment. These people that Peter wrote to, they obtained like precious faith with the apostles and with the Jewish believers. And he was sending them something. And as you look at verse 5 today, he's mentioning faith, but he's saying, yes, you've got a foundation of faith, but do not stay there, build on it, and move forward. That's why it says in verse 5, and beside this, Giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge. Going on to verse 6, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. Then it says in verse 8, for if these things be in you, which things? The faith, and the virtue, and the knowledge, and the godliness, as well as the, every other thing, the temperance and the patience and, and the brotherly kindness, if all this is abide in you and abound and increase and multiply, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor fruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things, he that says, I have faith, like precious faith, and he lacks the virtue, and he lacks the knowledge, and he lacks the temperance, and he lacks the patience, and he lacks the godliness, brotherly kindness, and charity. He that lacketh these things is blind, and he cannot see afar off, but he has forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. You see the importance then of what Peter, by the inspiration of the Spirit, is telling you and I, is telling us, Yes, you've got a foundation of faith, but you need to build on that foundation of faith. That's what we're looking at today, building on the foundation of faith. There is no doubt, as we look at all these references we have read, that the recipients of this epistle, they already had faith in Christ. That is, they had saving faith. By grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. They had this initial gift of saving faith and their faith was pure and genuine not fake not counterfeit it was tried and strengthened not weak or shallow it was steadfast not wavering come back to you uh, the first epistle of peter and as we look at first epistle of peter chapter one i'm reading from verse five who are kept by the power of god through faith unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time these people had been saved and they were being kept by the power of god through faith unto that final eternal salvation in verse 6 wherein ye greatly rejoice though for a season now if it need be ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations 
that the trial of your faith, being more precious than that of gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto the praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. They had faith, but that faith was being tried. They, there were persecutions coming upon them, opposition coming upon them, but it was genuine faith. Although their faith was tried, yet the faith stood firm. Come on to verse 9. Receiving the end of your faith, receiving the result of your faith, the re receiving the product of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. There is no doubt then that these people were reading about, they were saved. And they were saved by faith. They had an initial deposit of faith. But then Peter, by inspiration, needed to tell them, don't stay there. Don't just stand there and be stagnant and be static. You need to build upon the faith which you already have. Building on the foundation of faith. If you look at um, 1 Peter chapter 5, 1 Peter chapter 5, reading there from verse 7, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Because he's your father now. You are born again. You are children of God. What are you to do now? Understand, he cares for the sparrows, and none of them will fall to the ground without the knowledge of your heavenly father. If he cares for you like that, Put that faith to work and cast all your cares, all your problems, all your anxiety, all your worry, everything that is bothering you, cast every sin on the Lord because he careth for you. Then he said, be sober and be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. I want to tell you that the adversary, the devil, is not as mighty, is not as powerful as you know many people think. In fact, he is not omnipotent. Only God is omnipotent. He doesn't have all power. And he is not omnipresent. Present everywhere. That is why it says, he walketh about. He walketh about. When he's there, he is not here. When he's here, he is not there. That's why he walketh about. When God challenged Satan and said, Satan, where are you coming from? Have you seen that my servant Job, that there is none like him on earth because he's perfect and he hates evil and trusts evil and he's just evil. And then he said, I've been on earth walking up and down, going to and fro. Why does he need to go to and fro? Why does he need to walk up and down? Because he's not omnipresent. Would you realize that then? Uh, you know, there are some people that say, hey, Satan is always with me. Satan is always here. No, Satan is not always there. If Satan is always there, how would he be in the, these other places? At the same time, Satan is not omnipotent, and Satan is not omnipresent, and Satan is not omniscient. He doesn't know all things. He doesn't have all power, and he's not in all places at the same time. He walketh about, and he's seeking whom he will devour. That means he doesn't get everybody. That's why he's seeking. That's why he's looking. Because it doesn't, it can't just jump on you and just devour you if you will not allow him. That's why verse 9 says, Whom resist steadfast in the faith. Resist steadfast in the faith. You can resist him. You can oppose him. You can shield yourself and protect yourself against the devil. Whom resist steadfast in the faith. And these people had the faith, and by that faith, they could resist the devil and stand firm and stand steadfast, and the devil will not be able to devour them. That's why now, on the basis of that foundation of faith, the faith that got them saved, the faith that was tried and they remained steadfast, the faith that they were, they were using to resist the devil, by which they were able to quench all the folly darts of the wicked one. On the basis of that faith, Build on it, building on the foundation of faith. That's why I come on to Second Peter chapter 1. I'm reading to you verse 5 again. And besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge. In that verse, you see three things. Number one, you see faith. Number two, you see virtue. Number three, you see knowledge. And we're dividing the study today into three parts. Number one, the foundation of growing faith. The foundation of growing faith. Number two, faithfulness with godly virtue. Faithfulness with godly virtue. Number three, following after growing knowledge. You need to run after it. Follow after it. 
And that's why you came here today. And that's why you, you're running after knowledge, the knowledge of the word of God. Because, you know, there is a lot to know about God, about Christ, about the Holy Spirit, about your very life, about the things provided for you in the word of God. And it is as you run after that knowledge. You pursue that knowledge. You follow after that knowledge. You search for that knowledge. You receive that knowledge. And you understand that knowledge. And you believe that knowledge. And you're obedient to that knowledge that you'll be able to grow in your spiritual life. Come back to number one, which is the foundation, the foundation of growing faith. Come to your first, second Peter again, second Peter, I'm reading from verse five. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith. Add to your faith. If the faith is not there, my brother, my sister, you cannot add to it. Add to your faith. Make sure, first of all, that the foundation is there. As you look at Matthew chapter 7, Matthew chapter 7, you see the importance of a, a foundation, a very strong foundation, before you build your spiritual house, your spiritual temple, your house of faith. In uh, Matthew chapter 7, reading from verse 24, Therefore, whosoever carried these things of mine, and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man, that built his house upon a rock. That's the foundation. Make sure that uh, your faith is like that of a rock. Steady and steadfast, unwavering, unshakable. Let that foundation of faith be there. And then it says, and the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not. For it was founded upon a rock. And everyone that heard these things of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. You see, if you don't have the foundation of faith, whatever you are trying to build on your Christian life, everything will collapse. That's the reason, as we're talking about. Christian growth, spiritual growth, growing up in the Lord. And these verses we're, we're examining uh, uh, this Monday and other Mondays, these verses are telling us how we will build on the foundation of faith and how we will grow and grow up in our spiritual life. Look at this then, the foundation of growing faith. As you see, it says, Besides this, what does that mean beside this? It means beside all the things I've told you about the very fact that the Lord, according to his mighty power, his divine power, he has given unto us great and precious promises that by these might be partakers of the divine nature. Having escaped the corruption that the world through us, beside all that, beside the promises, Beside the exhortation, beside the encouragement I've given you, beside everything you already know, beside everything you already possess, giving all diligence, which means make an effort, do your very best, toil to the point of pain, while you are trying to build on the foundation of faith, give diligence to it and add to your faith. But before I tell you what you are adding to your faith, I need to talk about that faith itself. Because you see, there are many people that do not understand that our faith does not just stand static and remain just in one place. In Romans chapter 1, Romans chapter 1, reading there in verse 17. Romans chapter 1, verse 17. It says, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. You see that? You see that? And the foundation of faith that we have is not just static, stagnant, staying in one place from faith to faith, which means there is saving faith, living faith, abiding faith, unwavering faith, great faith, strong faith, a faith, a kind of faith that moves mountains from faith to faith. It says therein is the righteousness of God revealed. And when it is revealed unto you, you can only see it, you can only perceive it, you can only understand it, and you can only receive it yourself, embrace it yourself by faith. And it is from faith to faith because it says, as it is written, the just, the justified, those who are pardoned, those whose sins are forgiven, those who have assurance of salvation, the just shall live by faith. Faith in Jude, verse 20 and verse 21. Jude, 
verse 20 and verse 21. In Jude verse 20, look at this. But ye beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith. On your most holy faith, building up yourself which means when you have this initial faith and you have this deposit of faith saving faith living faith abiding faith and by that faith you are saved by that faith your sins are forgiven now when you have that faith you're a faith man and a faithful man too and your life is based on faith and your life is built on believing god and believing the word of god now you don't stop there you build on this holy faith it says building up yourselves on, on your most holy faith praying in the holy ghost keep yourselves in the love of god looking for the mercy of our lord jesus christ unto eternal life unto life eternal in luke chapter 17 see what the apostles said uh, when they understood uh, the demand on their lives and what they will have to accomplish by this faith that the lord had deposited in their lives they knew that just the initial deposit of faith you have will not be enough you need to grow in it you need to come up in it that's why in luke chapter 17 and in verse 5 it says and the apostles said unto the lord increase our faith i'm sure if those apostles needed an increase of their faith and they needed to grow in their faith and they needed to broaden and expand and extend the foundation of faith if those apostles needed it i'm sure you need it too and as they prayed i believe you too you must be praying lord this small faith i have this deposit of faith i have is this enough to carry me through and all the problems i will see in life is this deposit of faith able to carry me through therefore lord i'm praying like the apostles prayed increase our faith that's what you are telling the lord it's when you expand that base of faith that foundation of faith when you extend it it is then you'll be able to stand stable and steadfast and solid and then the oppositions of the world and the persecutions you experience in life will not be able to move you it tells us in acts of the apostles chapter 26 you see there are a lot of things that faith do faith does in our lives acts of the apostles chapter 26 i'm reading to you from verse 18 it says to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance. Look at this, inheritance among them, which are sanctified by faith that is in me. That means you are saved by faith, but faith doesn't stop in its operation. Just at the point of salvation, faith continues, and by that same faith, if you allow that faith to grow, if you allow that faith, the base, the foundation of that faith to be extended, you can be sanctified by that same faith. In Second Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians chapter one, I'm reading to you there from verse three. Second Thessalonians chapter one, verse three. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren as it is meet, because that your faith groweth exceedingly. Do you see that? Do you see, I'm challenging you now. As you look at your own faith, as you look at your own following after the Lord, and you are the initial deposit of faith, I'm asking you, can we say about your faith, as Paul the Apostle said about the faith of the Thessalonian believers, that your faith groweth, not just growing ordinarily, or growing normally, or growing slowly, but groweth exceedingly, and the charity of every one of you, all of every one of you all toward each other abounded and that is the thing that we need to understand the lord wants our faith to grow and so that instead of having just the saving faith like a mustard seed then it grows and it grows and it grows and then you are sure that you have this strong steady stable steadfast foundation of faith in romans chapter 4 Romans chapter 4, I'm reading from verses 20 and 21. Romans 
chapter 4, verse 20 and verse 21, he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but he was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. Uh, your faith grows to the point that no matter what challenges you meet in life, you know that what the Almighty God has promised is able to perform. And then you are strong in faith. Ephesians chapter 6 Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 16. Ephesians 6, 16. And above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench some fiery darts, many fiery darts. Ah, you see now, the problem with many people, uh, you know, they complain, they say, you know, I'm facing such a terrible attack and such a terrible affliction and the arrows and the darts the devil is throwing at me. In fact, I am tired now. In fact, I'm confused now. In fact, I'm giving up now. Nobody will blame me. I endure this, I endure this, I endure that. But the, the thing is so sharp and the thing is so frequent, I cannot endure it anymore. It's your foundation of faith that is not broken enough that is not extensive enough when your foundation of faith is very strong and expansive don't you see there it says taking the shield of faith wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one you'll be able to stand whatever the persecution or opposition when you develop your faith and your foundation of faith is very very strong you'll be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one in galatians chapter 2 verse 20 galatians chapter 2 verse 20 it says i'm crucified with christ nevertheless i live yet not i but christ liveth in me and the life which i now live in the flesh i live by the faith of the son of god in fact it's not just ordinary faith now my faith is said is coming to the level of the very faith of the son of god what's the faith of the son of god all things written concerning me will be fulfilled and when he said, are you going to that place again? That's the place they wanted to kill you. No, no problem. All things written concerning me will be fulfilled. The Jews were looking for you. And, you know, they almost killed you the other time. Are you going to that place again? Now don't worry about that. All things written concerning me will be fulfilled. When you have the faith of the Son of God, all this, you know, cringing and fearing and cowardice, everything will pass away from your life because, you know, nothing actually can happen to you except what the Almighty God promised. Means. And what the Almighty God permits, He has the strength, He has the power to be able to uphold you and to be able to show that He has almighty power, all sufficient power, and nothing will be able to destroy your life. In fact, He's watching over the sparrows and He watches over you. In Colossians chapter 2, Colossians chapter 2, I'm reading to you from verse 5. Colossians 2, verse 5. For though I be absent in the flesh, Yet am I with you in the spirit, joying and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. There's a whole lot there, but you can see very clearly that you can be so grounded in the faith and be so solid in your faith that nothing will be able to shake you out of that foundation that the Lord himself has laid there. Uh, the strength of a foundation determines how strong the building will be, the building you want to put upon that foundation. Much of our Christian living, our faithfulness, our commitment, and ministry and much of, of our accomplishment depends upon the foundation and the steadfastness of our faith show me a man that has true conversion and you show me a man that has true faith show me a man that has genuine christian life and genuine christian experience and you show me a man that has genuine christian faith because true conversion is the result of true faith a solid christian profession is the outcome of a sure stable faith a shining christ-like life can only be the result of the product of a steadfast faith in christ you see somebody is uncompromising in his christian life and uncompromising christian life always follows unwavering faith in christ lively faith then is not static lively faith is not something that doesn't have 
something within. Join to it as an evidence that this is living, lively, saving faith. A transforming faith, if you please. Dead objects don't grow. Dead faith and dead profession are rotting. And such faith will produce rottenness and corruption. It's lively faith that grows, will grow in strength will grow in value, will grow in kind, will grow in manifestation as you read the word of God, study the word of God, accept the word of God, believe the word of God, and obey the word of God. What does the word, does the word say? So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, the knowledge of God, and the knowledge of his word will strengthen your faith and will increase your faith. I'm calling upon you then, strengthen your foundation of faith. And your spiritual life, your spiritual house, will be able to withstand any storm. Now, after we have settled the foundation of faith, don't you understand that the foundation is not the whole building? If a man spent all his life building a good foundation, and he has a good foundation and a strong foundation. Does that mean he has built a house? No, not at all. The foundation is just the preliminary. It's just the beginning. It's what it is. It is foundation. That's the reason why after you have settled that by the grace of God, you have faith, saving faith, lively faith. That initial faith that brings salvation into your life. And that initial faith that helps you to live the Christian life. Then you want to build upon it. That's why it says, come on now to 2 Peter chapter 1 and in verse 5. In 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 5, and besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. Add to your faith virtue. As we talk about adding this virtue, and that brings us to point number two, faithfulness with godly virtue. And that means you are not careless in your life, you are not an indolent Christian, and you are not a Christian that says, well, uh, the fact that I'm even saved, the fact that I'm even born again, I think I've got something already. You realize, you understand, that's not enough. And therefore you want to make all the effort necessary that you want to build upon that foundation of faith and you want to add to your faith virtue. What is virtue? As we look at this word in the New Testament, in the original language, it means moral excellence. When we say virtue, it means moral excellence. It means goodness of action. Add to your faith moral excellence. Add to your faith goodness of action. What is virtue? It's a force. It's a spiritual energy coming from the Holy Ghost and it accompanies the preaching and the reception of the word of God, of the gospel, the true gospel and the full gospel manifested in human behavior. This thing that is called virtue, you know what it is? It includes courage. When we say somebody is virtuous, it means he's also courageous and it also includes passion and power in usefulness it says add to your faith the passion the power to be useful you pass through this life but once and every opportunity you have to be able to do good when you have the passion you have the desire you have the drive, you have the inner force you have the energy to do that good thing that's virtue and then you actually do it. What is virtue? Virtue is an act worthy of praise. When you do something that is praiseworthy, when you do something that God praises, when you do something that onlookers, your neighbors, that they praise, any action that is worthy of praise, that's virtue. It says then, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. No matter how lively, no matter how genuine, no matter how strong your faith may be, it will become weak and lifeless if it stands alone. You see that? It is, it is when you add virtue to that faith. That's when that faith is trending. It is when you add something. Don't you see, look up here. You see those who are building houses, if they just laid the foundation and they don't build anything on it, and then you have rain coming, and you have the storm, and you have the flood, 
and you have everything and the foundation remains there no matter how strong how strong that foundation was if the rain comes and the flood comes and you are not adding anything you are not building upon that foundation it will be weakened that's the same thing no matter how strong how lively your face might be if you are not adding the virtue and the moral excellence and the goodness of character and everything that is of good behavior if you are not adding it to that foundation that foundation will become weak the first thing then it tells us if you are going to strengthen your faith and if your faith is going to be what you thought to be just a foundation the very first thing you are going to do is to add virtue moral excellence acts worthy of praise courage of conviction passionate desire to be useful add it to your faith add virtue to faith why because faith without virtue is like faith without good words and you know faith without words is dead and when you have the dead fellow there not buried will soon be stinking and that stinking face that is dead neither pleases God nor benefits man. Faith without virtue is faith without moral excellence. And it's no better than the faith of devils. Do you know that uh, Satan also and the devils and the demons, they manifest a kind of faith? Only that that faith doesn't have moral excellence, doesn't have good works, doesn't have virtue, doesn't have good behavior. And it's just faith, faith, faith. I believe in God. Look at it. In James chapter 2. James chapter 2, verses 19 and 20. Thou believest that there is one God that doeth well. But that's not the end. The devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? You see, faith without virtue. Faith without moral excellence. Faith without good works. Faith without good character. Faith without acts worthy of praise. That kind of faith is dead. And it will make you a companion of devils on earth as well as in eternity. What does the Bible say? It says, though I have all faith, so that I can move mountains and have not but you, charity, love, good works, acts, of kindness i am nothing that's first corinthians chapter 13 verse 2 faith that pleases god the kind of faith that pleases god is a kind of faith that has virtue that has christ likeness that has godliness in it check up in your bible all the heroes of faith that we find in hebrews chapter 11 they had virtue they had good works they had deeds of obedience accompanying their faith that's why it says, giving all diligence, make the utmost effort and add to your faith virtue. And look at the word of God as we look at what virtue is. In Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. I'm looking at verse 7 all through to verse 9. And the peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. That's what he's saying. He says, brethren, you believe in the Lord. If you go from chapter 1 of the Philippians, you know they believe in the Lord already. They had this faith already. The faith in the Lord that got them saved. Got them into the kingdom of God. But then it says, you have to add to that. And whatsoever things are true. And whatsoever things are honest. Dishonesty doesn't go along with true faith. Hypocrisy doesn't go along with true faith. Deception doesn't go along with true faith. Bad behavior doesn't go along with, with real faith. Sin, unrighteousness does not go along with true faith. That's why it says, now you are born again, Philippian believers, and you say you are children of God. You know what you have to think about? Because your thought affects your action, and your action determines your character. 
from the thought to the actions to the habit to the character and if you're going to be of good behavior if you're going to be of good character you will have good thoughts whatsoever things are true and whatsoever things are honest and whatsoever things are just and whatsoever things are pure whatsoever things are lovely 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 beautiful like a fresh flower it says whatsoever things are good report if there be any virtue if there be any praise think on these things in ruth let's see an example let's see virtue personified and see this virtue demonstrated in the life of a person in ruth chapter 3 rather ruth chapter 3 i'm looking at verses 10 and 11 and he said this is boaz talking to ruth blessed be thou of the lord my daughter for thou hast showed more kindness you see kindness and that, that's acts worthy of praise that's why boaz was praising her and that's virtue and it says you have shown more kindness in the latter end than at the beginning in so much as thou followed not young men whether poor or rich this woman had lost her husband and then she came to town with Naomi. And there were many men all around. Oh, but this woman just kept herself in chastity, in purity, in holiness, in righteousness. People were watching her. Do you know people are watching you? Single lady, widow, Christian woman. Do you know people are watching you? And they see how you come out and how you go in. And they see the people that visit you. And you think they don't know, but they know. They were watching rude. And she, he said, you have not followed young men, whether poor or rich. And now my daughter, fear not. I will do, I will do to thee all that thou request. Then he said, require it. And he said, for all the city of my people does know that thou art a virtuous woman. Righteous woman. A woman of moral excellence. A woman that has acts worthy of praise. A woman of good behavior. A woman of purity, chastity, honesty, holiness, righteousness. That's a virtuous woman. And we have more description as we come to Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 31. Proverbs chapter 31. I'm reading to you from verse 10. Proverbs chapter 31 from verse 10 who can find a virtuous woman for her price is above rubies her heart the heart of her husband does simply trust in her so she so that he has no need of spoil she will do him good virtuous woman she will do him good i told you virtue acts of goodness Acts worthy of praise. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. She seeketh wool, she is not lazy. Flax. And walketh willingly, cheerfully, honestly with her hands. She is like the merchant's sheep. She bringeth her food from afar. She riseth also while it is yet night. And giveth meat to her household and a portion to her maidens. She considereth a field and buyeth it. Enterprising woman. Because she is not going to be going around begging uh, for food from other men. It is a virtuous woman. And then giveth me to her household and a portion to the maiden. She considereth a field and buyeth it. And with the fruit of her hands, she planteth a vineyard. She gathers her loins with strength. And strengtheneth her arms. She perceiveth that her merchandise is good. A candle goes not out by night. No, she is going to take care of everything. There's no carelessness in her life. She lays her hand to the spindle, and her hands hold the distaff. She stretches out her hand to the poor. She's even caring for the poor as well with all the material, the things she has. Yea, she reaches forth her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of the snow for her household. For all her household are clothes with scarlet. She maketh herself coverings of tapestry. Her clothing is silk and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he seated among the elders of the land. Because of the virtue in the life of this woman, even the husband is respected in society. 
she maketh fine linen and selleth it and delivereth girdles unto the merchant. Strays and honor her, her clothing and she shall rejoice in time to come. She openeth her mouth with wisdom. This is virtue that you don't talk anyhow. You don't talk anything that is foolish. Anything that your husband will say, my dear, why are you, after all these years of reading Bible, sharing together, after all these years of fellowship, you're still talking like this. Are you, why are you talking like this? This is not all right. But this virtuous woman, she opens her mouth with wisdom and her tongue is, in her tongue is the law of kindness. She looketh well to the ways of her household and eateth not the bread of idleness. Her children arise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, he praises her. Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. Favor is deceitful and beauty is vain. But a woman that fears the Lord, that's part of the virtue. A woman that fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her the fruit of her hands and let her, let her own works praise her in the gaze. Uh, this is virtue, moral excellence, good behavior, Christ-like behavior. Look at Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. As we look at uh, the description of virtue in the Bible, and as we are reading all this, you are asking yourself, is my life virtuous? Do I, do I have this virtue? Am I adding unto my foundation of faith? Am I adding virtue unto it? In uh, Romans chapter 12, I'm reading from verse 9, let love be without dissimulation. Don't let your love be just this empty, shallow, plastic, laughter and smile let it be real let it come out of your heart let there be no hypocrisy out of your love let love be without dissimulation abhor reject shun hate that which is evil cling to that which is good be kindly affection one to another with brotherly love in honor preferring one another don't project yourself don't let don't let pride get the better part of you Become lowly so that others can come in front of you in honor, preferring one another. It says not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer, distributing to the necessity of the saints, and giving to hospitality. Bless them that persecute you. Persecution will come. Opposition will come. Criticism will come. The, the very fact that you are able to bless them that persecute you means you are adding virtue to your faith. If you want to know a real Christian who is growing in his Christian life, look at the way he treats the people that persecute him or her. Look at the friends that turn to be foe. Look at the way he deals with them and relates with them. Look at his actions and reactions to the people that do not fully, totally, every time agree with him. You will know whether the man, whether the woman, whether that Christian is adding virtue to the faith or is not adding virtue to the faith. It says, it says over there, bless them which persecute you. Bless and cause not. Rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that do weep. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not I things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceit. There will be no pride when you are adding virtue to your faith. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. You know, people around you will do evil. Recompense to no man evil for evil. He did that against me. He said that against me. All right. I know what I'm going to do in retaliation. That's not virtuous. That's vice. That's evil. That's satanic character. Retaliation, revenge, that's satanic character. You want to have godly character, Christ-like character. You don't throw stones at them just because they throw stones at you. You know, somebody throws a stone at you. Then you dodge. You said, you think you'll get me. Then you pick up that stone. You aim and target him. And then you break his head. His head. You say, that's good for you. You think you'll be able to do that to me and get away scot-free. Are you proud because you are able to revenge and retaliate and hurt other people who wanted to hurt you? Is that godly? 
Is that Christ-like? Is that not the character of Satan and demons? Recompense to no evil, to no man, evil for evil, but provide things honest in the sight of all men, if it be possible. As much as it lies in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, and I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. And then that's the kind of life the Lord wants us to live when we have virtue. Add virtue to your faith. In First John, First John, I'm reading chapter 2 and in verse 6. First John, chapter 2, verse 6. He that says he abideth in him, ought himself also so to work, even as he walked. You just ask yourself the question, what will Christ do? Whatever Christ will do, that's what you do. That's virtue. That's virtue. And that is a godly character that the Lord is expecting from every one of us in First Thessalonians chapter 2. First Thessalonians chapter 2. Reading there from verse 10, ye are witnesses. And God also, this is virtue, how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. As ye know how we exalted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father does his children, that he would walk worthy of God, who has called you unto his kingdom and glory. In First Timothy chapter 6, First Timothy Chapter 6, verse 11 and verse 12. But thou, O man of God, thou, O child of God, brother, sister, flee these things and follow after righteousness and godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith. Not the bad fight of unbelief. Not the bad fight of the world. Well, it's just saying, fight the good fight of faith. What that simply means is repentance. The faith delivered once unto the saints. And the restitution. Fight your corrupt nature. Fight your human nature. Fight your weakness that will not allow you to follow that faith once delivered unto the saints. When it says fight the good fight of faith, that doesn't call me to fight you or you to fight me or you people there to fight one another. Fight your corrupt nature and fight your weakness and put your body under so that whatever temptation comes your way, while your flesh is wanting to, you know, go and do that thing, you fight yourself. You fight your corrupt nature. And you put your body under so that the watch of God will be established in your life. Fight the good fight of faith. And you know, there are some ignorant uh, churchgoers. I can't call them Christians. And when there is, you know, maybe a disagreement between them and another person, then they become angry and they become aggressive and they'll say, I show you that my commitment is to fight the good fight of faith. When I see a good fight, I get myself involved in it and I'm going to fight a good fight of faith. Ah, you're fighting your brother, you're fighting your wife, you're fighting your husband. That's a good fight of faith. Tell me. No, you fight your corrupt nature. That thing that wants to get angry inside you, that's the thing to fight. That thing that wants to get uh, covetous inside you, that's the thing to fight. That thing that wants to get impatient with God. I must marry today. I must marry today. If I don't marry today, I won't come to church again. That's the thing to fight. That thing that wants to disbelieve the word of God, the restitution, the righteousness, the holiness, that corruption in you, that weakness in you, that's the thing to fight. Fight the good fight of faith. While you are doing that, you lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. That's virtue. Come back now to Second uh, Peter chapter 1. Second Peter Chapter 1. I'm reading there from verse 5 again. In 2 Peter chapter 1, reading from verse 5, and beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue 
knowledge. It says giving all diligence. It means we're to be diligent in this. We're not to do this just carelessly, hurriedly, and just haste, and just do it somehow. Giving all diligence. What does it mean to be diligent? To be diligent means to make deliberate, purposeful effort. Calculated effort. That I see the foundation of faith, and I need to build on that foundation, and I make intelligent effort, deliberate, purposeful effort, to build on that foundation. It means I am so desirous, and I'm so concerned, and I'm going to act without delay. That means I'm diligent about it. It means I am laboring earnestly, and I'm laboring fervently. I'm laboring without ceasing. I want to do my very best to perform the kind of labor accompanied with pain. It will not always be convenient. But when you are diligent, you are determined. You are resolute. And you say, this is a good thing. It must be done if my Christian life is going to be what it ought to be. That's the reason why you are so diligent about it and you are adding virtue to faith and you are adding knowledge to virtue. Ignorance weakens us and creates confusion and failure in our lives. That's the reason why we follow after growing knowledge. That's why it says that foundation of faith is there at virtue. After you have added virtue, add knowledge. Knowledge of the right kind brings light and assurance and produces and increases faith and establishes the heart in courage and conviction and it improves the quality of a spiritual life in the spiritual life your knowledge who you know your knowledge what you know will be of great assistance to your progress and victory to grow in life and ministry you must keep growing in faith and growing in virtue and growing in knowledge. Look at this third point then. Following after growing knowledge. In Second Peter chapter 3 verse 18. Second Peter chapter 3 verse 18. But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To whom be glory both now and forever. And everybody said... Amen. Grow. Grow in grace. And then grow in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Uh, you, you know the Savior already if you are born again. But you don't know enough concerning the Savior. Study about the Lord. About Jesus Christ. And know what we have in Christ. What we have through Christ. What we can do by Christ in the strength of the Lord. Grow in the knowledge of the Lord. Know the titles of the Lord Jesus Christ. And know the offices of the Lord Jesus Christ. Grow in your knowledge of Jesus Christ. Know the difference between the risen Christ and the earthly Christ when he was here. And the glorified Christ. What he's doing on the right hand of majesty right now. Grow in your knowledge of Christ. Know about the works of Christ what he has done before, what he is doing now, what he has done for other people, and what he is able to do for you. Grow in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the more you know of God, the more you know of Jesus Christ, and the more you know of the Holy Spirit, the more you will find that you are strengthened in the Lord. You are courageous in the Lord. And then you possess more things in the Lord. Your knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ is so very significant for your spiritual growth. That's why it says, but grow in grace and grow in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 4, I'm reading verse 13 first, then I'll back up and go to verse 11. Ephesians chapter 4, in verse 13, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. It says, we should be growing to the point until the new convert and the old convert and the members, all the members, until we all come in the unity of the faith and also of the knowledge of the Son of God, and then unto the perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. 
That's the way we ought to grow. Now come back to verse 11. And he gives some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ until we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And that, that's our goal. That's our goal. And that whatever you know now, you ask yourself, have you come to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ? Of course, no. That's the reason you're still following after, running after, and desiring, and reading in your life until you come to a mature kind of knowledge concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. And then what you know in your head will affect what you believe in your heart. And what you believe in your heart will affect how you react, relate with people in your life. The knowledge will be transferred into behavior and action. In Proverbs chapter 2, Proverbs chapter 2, following after growing knowledge, running after growing knowledge, seeking growing knowledge, searching for growing knowledge, just wanting to know everything there is to know concerning the Lord and concerning his word. In Proverbs chapter 2, Proverbs chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 3. Yea, if thou Christ after knowledge and liftest up thy voice unto understanding, and thou seekest her as silver, and searchest for her as for hid treasures, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord, and find the knowledge of God. You cry after that knowledge, you lift up your voice for that knowledge, you're seeking that knowledge, then will you find that knowledge of God. You must seek, you must search, you must run after. That no matter what you know already of Christ, you want to know more. And that's the attitude that we find revealed in Scripture concerning Paul the Apostle. In Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, I'm reading to you from verse 8. Philippians 3, verse 8. Ye doubtless, and I count all things but loss, for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. He said, I so much appreciate the knowledge of Christ, my Lord, and the glory and the excellence and the beauty of the knowledge of Christ that I just abandon all other things and I count all things but done so that I will be able to have this excellence of the knowledge of Christ, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them, but don't, that I may win Christ and may found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him. He knew him already. This is a man that had been to the third heavens, and yet he said, although I met Christ on the way to Damascus, and although I'm born again, although I am sanctified, although I'm filled with the Holy Ghost, with the power of the Holy Ghost, and I've done quite a lot through that power and unction and anointing of the Holy Spirit, although I know so much about him, I still want to know him more. That's passionate desire and passionate search after the knowledge of Christ. That's why he said that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being com made complete formable unto his death. And that's the way you ought to do it also. And be passionate about it. And be eager about it. That you want the knowledge of Christ more than what you have at present. Colossians chapter 1, reading from verse 9. Colossians chapter 1, I'm reading to you from verse 9. It says, for this cause, we also cease, we cease, we heard it, we do not cease to pray for you and to desire that he might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. And do you see Paul the apostle for himself that I might know him? For himself, he abandoned every other thing so that he will have the glory, the power, the excellency, the beauty of the knowledge of Christ. 
And then for all the people, he was telling them too that this was his prayer for them. And he was praying and praying and praying without ceasing, without stopping for them, that they will be filled with the knowledge of the will of God and that they will walk worthy unto the Lord in all places, that they will be fruitful in every good work and they will be increasing and increasing and increasing in the knowledge of God. That's my desire for you too. That's why we spend our time on Mondays and we come to the Bible study and we just dig into the Word. And it's my desire for you that you will not just come to the Bible study and then when we finish, you just run back home and then when we ask you the following day or the, or the following week, what's your lunch? You've forgotten everything. We want you to be so saturated and filled with the knowledge of God because the more of the knowledge of Christ you have, the more of the power of his resurrection will be manifested in your life. And then in Romans chapter 15, Romans chapter 15, they are in verses 14 and 15. Romans chapter 15, verse 14. It says, And I myself also am persuaded of you, my brethren, that ye also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge. Filled with all knowledge. Filled with all knowledge. Able also to admonish one another. The more you know, and you're filled with the knowledge of the mighty one. The more you'll be able to counsel yourself. The more you'll be able to take right decisions for yourself. The more you'll be able to act right in every situation. And the more you'll be able to advise and counsel and lead and guide other people the way they ought to go. Nevertheless, brethren, I have written more boldly unto you in some sort. As putting you in mind because of the grace that is given unto me of God. Although you are filled with much knowledge, even all knowledge, I still, I'm still bold to write unto you. Because all the knowledge you have, you don't possess everything yet. What's to be your attitude now? What are you to do? Here is what you are to do. Look at, as we conclude in Isaiah chapter 50. Isaiah chapter 50. I'm reading to you there in verse 4. Isaiah chapter 50. And we're looking at verse 4. It says, The Lord God has given me the tongue of the learned, that I should know, that I should know, that I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. The knowledge that you are receiving is not just for yourself. Your faith is not just for yourself. Your faith is to benefit others. Your virtue is to benefit others. And your knowledge is to benefit others. All this effort we are making, so that you can be filled with the knowledge of God. It's not just for your private, personal, little circle, little life. It's so that you can be of benefit to other people. That I may know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. Because of that, he wakened me morning by morning. He wakened my ear to hear as the learned. You know, apart from just coming on Monday night like this and listening to the word of God, he wakes you up every morning. And then you go to the rich study of the word of God. And you take in the knowledge of the mighty one. The knowledge of God, the knowledge of Christ, and the knowledge of eternal things. Every morning. And then you are able to, whatever you meet during the day then, you are able to help. You're able to counsel, you're able to advise, you're able to direct other people. Then in verse 5, the Lord God has opened mine ears. Tonight, I see opened your ears. The Lord God has opened mine ears, and I was not. Tell me out loud. You know, and there are some people uh, when the word of God is coming forth and coming forth, when it gets to a particular stage and particular time, they shut up. They say, enough, no more. But this person said, I know what God is trying to do. He's trying to build up my life and he's trying to uh, give me the word so I can be strong because it's the word that makes me strong. Therefore, he opens my ears and I was not rebellious. I didn't shut up. Not, neither turned away back. I've received the word. Have you received the word today? And beside all this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. 
and to your virtue knowledge. Let's rise up in prayer. Make sure you settle the foundation of faith. And if after settling that foundation of faith, then you can add to that foundation of faith. The faith that makes us to repent and to believe on the Lord. The faith that gives us salvation, life eternal. That gives us assurance. He has forgiven my sins. That's a foundation. Make that foundation strong. That there is no doubt in your heart anymore. That you know, you know, you know. Beyond any shadow of doubt that you are saved. That you are born again. You are holding on to the promises of God. And you believe those promises of God. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. He will forgive if only they believe. You turn away from sin if my people which are called by my name. Shall humble themselves. And seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin. I will heal their land. You allow him to do that in your life. And there is that foundation of faith that brings salvation, that brings conversion, that brings a change of life. But after you are saved, you don't sit back at home. You keep on coming to the study. Coming to the study because you want to add to the foundation of your faith. You want to add virtue. You want to add moral excellence. You want to add good behavior. If any man be in Christ, it's a new creature. All things are passed away and behold, all things have become new. Add virtue. Add moral excellence. Add act worthy of praise. Good deeds, good works. That's what you add. And then with that good behavior, moral excellence, virtue, you add knowledge. Until you are filled of the knowledge of God, the knowledge of Christ, and you know, beyond a shadow of doubt, what the Lord has provided for you in His world, that I may know Him. He knew Him already as Savior, that I may know Him. He knew Him already as Sanctifier, that I may know Him. He knew him already, being the baptizer of the Holy Ghost, and yet he said, the time may know him. He knew about his glory, about his coming again. He knew about the rapture already. He knew about the things that the Lord will do when he comes. But he said, the time may know him. And the power of his resurrection, be made conformable unto his death. You want to know him more. You want to know him more. You want to know him more. And you want to be diligent about it. You want to make a deliberate effort, a purposeful effort to know him more. That I may know him. That I may know him. That I may know him. And the power of his resurrection. Be made conformable unto his sufferings. Let the Lord do something in your heart today. Do something in your life. So that your spiritual life will grow. Your spiritual life will grow solidify, strengthen that foundation of faith, then add virtue and add knowledge.